Okay. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, the title of my talk today is what is the meaning of my online life? And I hope I'm going to piggyback off of a lot of what's been said uh, already in the past couple of days for the conference. Um, and I just wanted to say I'm actually very grateful to be here, um, mostly just because my, as you'll see, I'm not really more digital, more humanities. Uh, my PowerPoint's not going to be the best uh, compared to some of the other ones. Um, so basically what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, oh, sorry, there we go. Um, so this is just an overview of my presentation. Uh, it's broken up into sections, but it's just going to be one sort of long stream. Um, so first I'm going to look at Maria Schechtman's uh, narrative self-constitution view, and mostly what I'm going to be working within is the uh, sphere of philosophy and personal identity. And I have to talk a little bit about uh, John Locke and his psychological account before I, before I get to that. And so the second section, I'm going to look at a paper that Schechtman has written uh, where she employs this view and talks about uh, this thing called second life and how their avatars, uh, some would claim, are as real as their real life selves in any philosophically interesting way. And I just want to push in my third section just a little bit more how I think we can um, think about these claims or just the way that she's uh, engaging with her view in this discussion. Um, just a little bit more, especially with what we've uh, seen recently. And I'm just going to bring a couple examples uh, that I've seen. Um, and again, I'm not <laughs> very more philosophy and that kind of stuff. Um, and it's also the not the only view that I want to talk about today. Um, and it's worth mentioning that there are so many views uh, in philosophy for personal identity. And this is really just uh, one of them. And it's actually just one of the narrative approaches as well. Um, so I'm not going to cover any of those details, but I'm just going to cover um, mostly what uh, is entailed in Schechtman's uh, narrative approach and just try and push a little bit more. Um, so before I do that, I just have to talk a little bit, a little bit um, about John Locke. And so we actually talked about Descartes yesterday. Uh, Sandra did a presentation. Um, so Descartes usually thought that um, there was this idea called substance. And substance was uh, God, essentially, because he didn't uh, need to be created by any other entity. And by extension, he also believed that we were, uh, essentially, as persons, we were made of substance. And Locke argued against this and basically said that it was consciousness and not substance uh, that constitutes personal identity. Um, and so most philosophy students, or if you've heard this before, um, this is usually the prince and cobbler uh, thought experiment. So essentially, if you imagine there's a prince and the cobbler, and the psychological life of the prince gets transferred from the prince's body to the cobbler's body, um, perhaps by brain transplant or something else. Um, so the, the person that moves there to the other body, Locke uh, famously thought, um, he thought that it wasn't the cobbler, but actually the prince. Uh, so according to Locke, the, essentially the person that would come out of this uh, sort of uh, situation is not actually the cobbler, and it's actually sort of logical for us to think that the prince would actually still be able to undertake his relationships and that kind of stuff. And what's really interesting is we actually see this intuition uh, in some sort of popular uh, cultures and uh, examples. So one that I just know, um, I'm not really big on movies again, um, but films like Freaky Friday uh, give us this sort of intuition. Um, but for a number of reasons, uh, Schechtman uh, has covered some of these herself. Um, this is sort of a dubious philosophical position to hold. Um, and so essentially, instead of psychological continuity, uh, Schechtman argues that we actually should follow the notion that unity of a narrative is what we should uh, look for in personal identity. Uh, so she says, quote, we constitute ourselves as persons, I argue, by coming to understand our lives as narratives with the form of the story of a person's life. End quote. And it's also just worth mentioning here, too, that she's written a book to sort of distance herself from this view, but I still think it's um, worth taking up and, and thinking about. Um, so the basic Lockean notion that she's still taking from here is that the idea that being a person involves what is typically called forensic activities, um, which is typically thought of as moral responsibility and recog recognizing yourself as a being who is uh, applicable to certain moral responsibilities. Um, so to ex explain this, she says, uh, quote, the basic claim of the narrative view is that in order to live a life of this kind, we need to have a conception of ourselves as beings who live such lives. We need to think of ourselves as governed by norms in order to be capable of being governed, uh, so governed by this, the argument, and, the, and this, the argument goes, uh, entails having an autobiographical narrative. Um, so you might even just notice that it's uh, very similar to some of the things that we've already looked at. And again, there's very similar, a lot of similarities that I can't really get into uh, with other narrative approaches. Um, so essentially, uh, what I'm going to do now is just talk to you a little bit about uh, her book actually here, Narrative uh, narrative approach and just give you a, a very brief outline so you can understand what I'm talking about in the paper um, that she wrote later. So 
the first sort of uh, main thing that you need to know about her view uh, is that, quote, it requires that persons have an ongoing autobiographical narratives. Uh, so even though it does require that, it doesn't require uh, or demand that they consciously or explicitly articulate their life stories uh, continuously or ever at all, end quote. Um, so again, without getting into the, to the weeds on this too much, um, essentially what she's saying is that a person's identity is defined and sort of conceptualized within the limits of an integrity of a unified narrative. Um, so to put it in a different uh, way, she says, quote, the actions and experiences appropriated into a person's ongoing self-narrative conception are for that reason rightly attributable to her, end quote. Um, so it's just this very, very basic idea, and I'm just going to explain two sort of articulation uh, and reality constraints that she uses to um, further defend this idea. Um, and this is going to be a little bit of a long quote, uh, but so according to the first one, uh, quote, a person's narrative must conform to a fundamental and largely uncontroversial uh, everyday facts about the nature of the world that we live in. So, for example, you can't say that, you know, humans uh, live more than 300 years and they can't be in place, two places at once. And the articulation constraint is, uh, says that someone must be able to articulate uh, parts of her narrative. Sorry, there's a typo there. Uh, locally when appropriate. Uh, for example, you have to be able to say something in response to questions uh, like, who are you? Are you employed? Uh, where do you come from? And so on, end quote. So to be sure, as life often goes, uh, Sheckman's narrative, narrative view doesn't really require us to always have our narratives be free of inaccuracies or ambiguities. Um, to the contrary, according to these two constraints, actually, uh, the person or narrator just needs to be able to engage in the forensic relations of personhood, there's that Lockean notion again, um, that requires us applying these kind of concepts to our own life in certain contexts. So now I'm gonna turn on a little bit, uh, shift uh, to her paper, um, and it's actually titled The Story of My Second Life, Virtual Worlds and Narrative Identity. And uh, you'll see in the, in the, uh, on the side there, I have a little <laughs> uh, snapshot. Um, this is what it looks like in 2020. She wrote the paper in 2012. So I don't know if there's any differences, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, so essentially in her paper, uh, she's dealing with a lot of uh, issues here, but really we just need to understand that Second Life is an online virtual reality game where users, uh, she says, quote, can register for a free account or for a fee, uh, a, get a premium account that allows them to own land. Uh, no surprise there. Um, so once they have their account, uh, users can then create avatars with controls over their screen name, gender, species, and overall appearance, as well as they have the freedom to interact with other Second Life users in this virtual world. So I want to just lay out the central question that she's working with here. So she's attempting to essentially consider, quote, whether there is something, uh, some metaphysical meaningful sense in which the claims that for some